I was first introduced to Candide when I was 18. I was a freshman at a Jesuit college, Holy Cross. And the problem was that Candide was listed on the Vatican's Index of Forbidden Books. If you were a practicing Catholic at that point and you wanted to read such a book, you had to get the written permission of your bishop. So being like Candide himself, young, naive, uh, I wrote to the Bishop of Worcester, Massachusetts, whose name was Flanagan, as I remember, uh, asking for permission to read Candide, Madame Bovary, and The Red of the Black. All three of these three books appealed to me, I guess, as forbidden fruit. What appealed to me as an 18-year-old about Candide was uh, its irreverence, um, its, um, its wit, its satire, its uh, brevity. Uh, I still like 90-page books uh, as opposed to 900-page books. And the fact that, uh, I guess the fact that so many complex, important human elements were dealt with, war, rape, mayhem, theft, sexual trafficking, uh, anti-Semitism is there, although Voltaire is not conscious in seeing that as an evil. I think what he sought and does indeed provide through this story in the way that it evolves, and especially the ending of the story, is that we can and should deliberately structure our lives in a way that is, on the one hand, enlightened, but more importantly, becomes a bulwark, a defense against evil that one person perpetrates against another. No, I, I, I wouldn't call Voltaire an optimist. I think this is a very, very balanced book in terms of the way that it analyzes the notion of optimism or pessimism. And you've got two characters, Martin and Pangloss, who represent those two opposing points of view. Pangloss, sort of big mouth, if you want a, a literal translation of, of the Greek words that make up the name Pangloss. Pangloss is an irremediable optimist. He can't be remediated. He can't change, no matter what his experiences are this conviction that all is for the best in the world. And then there's the other character, Martin, who is a total pessimist, is killed off rather early in the text. But they represent the polar opposites that Voltaire was confronting, and he comes out in the middle. So if I were to call Candide, the character, or Voltaire, the creator, anything, it would be a meliorist. Somebody who believes that there's a lot of evil all around, but if you commit yourself to change and you work at it, you can make things better, a bit, step by step. But, here's the key point, if you put a, a whole group of people together, or ultimately a society together, that works collectively as well as individually to, if not eradicate e evil, at least diminish its presence in the world, then you get a better society. And that's, I believe, from a, that's what Voltaire's politics are uh, in this text. When Random House came into being in 1928, those in charge of the company decided that the very first book they would publish would be Voltaire's Candide in a splendid limited edition to be illustrated by Rockwell Kent, one of the single most important artists to illustrate books in America. And what I find very, very interesting is that on the colophon page, there is a little house on the water you could argue, I suppose, that this is the house that Candide and his companions lived in at the end of the tale when they're cultivating the garden on the banks of the Bosphorus. But the house itself becomes the Random House logo. Many around the world are familiar with the Random House logo, but I doubt there are many people that know that its origin is the last page, in effect, of the, the great Random House edition of Candide. First and foremost, I think that Voltaire was um, in the best sense of the terms, a propagandist. And uh, he used all the means at his disposal in the 18th century to get across as effectively as he could his message, which was basically a message of change. I think he would embrace new media, he would embrace the internet in order to get the message out. So I think that this is an age that he would capitalize on in terms of accessing people, 
consumers of information of points of view around the world instantaneously. So I think that would be a huge asset to whatever work he chose to be doing. Somebody who was against war to the extent that he was, he would be as horrified as we all are with not only the continuing presence of war in the world, but the vastly destructive power that we've created by which we can annihilate each other. So the wars of the 18th century were brutal. They caused immense loss of life and great, great suffering. But when you think of the 50 million people who lost their lives in the Second World War, when you look at the continuous warfare that we see in the world today, when you see the kind of want that exists, poverty, hunger, all these kinds of things, I guess Voltaire's conclusion is that there's still lots of work to be done, that um, the world is still highly imperfect, and that one must continue to be militant and argue for justice, argue against intolerance, against superstition, argue for human rights. Some have said Voltaire was the founder of the human rights movement, and that's a very legitimate claim to make for him, because in hindsight, he was one of the great, great heroes of a movement that is immensely important to society today. So I think that if he would engage in anything, now it would be the battle for human rights.